pray together. Father, as we look at your word today, I pray that your Holy Spirit will help us to hear you, to be encouraged by your grace, to really um, stand in that place where you put us so that people can know that you are there, that you are, you are in that place. Um, fill me with your Holy Spirit, allow me to speak clearly, and fill each one of us with your Spirit so we can hear you clearly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love this movie. It's a Wonderful Life. Anybody ever watch that? It's a little bit hokey, but it's but I, but I love it. You know, you've got this uh, Jimmy Stewart. He lives this life. He's George Bailey, and he lives this life, and he's always serving others and doing things for others. So he puts off his own desires, and then at the end, he's kind of uh, just depressed because you know he just feels like he's not accomplished anything, not been able to do the things he wanted to do. And then the the angel Clarence. I think uh, that the Bible talks about Raphael and uh, Michael and Clarence. No, Clarence is not in the Bible. I'm just kidding about that. But, the, but, but Clarence comes down and, and he says, you know, what? if you were, had never lived, this is what life would be like. And he takes him around and he finds out that his life really made an impact, that it was really different because he was there. And I thought about that. I thought, well, this is the 4th of July. You know, what if, what if there was never a George Washington? You know, what kind of hole would there be? You know, people talk about George Washington. They said he was pretty good as a military strategist. So maybe would it, the, the America would have lost the war against England and we'd still be, you know, drinking tea and eating crumpets or something like that, right? I mean, possibly, I, I don't know. Or maybe, you know, maybe, maybe they would have won the war, but somebody else would have stepped up and George Washington said he didn't want to be king. So maybe we'd have a King Joe instead of, uh, you know, now. You know, who knows? Our world would be totally different than, than it is now. Um, just because he had such an influence in his life. So keep that in mind. And we're going to look back at, at the prophet Ezekiel. In the Old Testament, we're going to look at this, this uh, story. And I can't see that real well, but this is a painting or a picture of somebody's idea of what Ezekiel's vision was. Is in chapter 1 of Ezekiel, he has this vision. It's called a theophany. That's just a big word to say he saw God in, in some way. And he saw these, these wheels inside of wheels with eyes all over the wheels. Who knows exactly what that was like? And he saw this rainbow. And there in the top, there's the throne. And there's the figure of, of God in some form up there, a shining figure. And this, this, this vision is crazy. And Ezekiel freaks out, and he falls down flat on his face, and he says, I can't do this. You know, this is, this is beyond me. This is too big. Imagine being in the presence of, of God in some way, in, in, that, in the actual presence like that. And in a Jewish mind, if you were in the presence of God, you'd, you'd be dead, right? So Ezekiel knows this, and he falls flat on his face, and he can't get up. And then we start what we're going to read today, the text today, and help me with this. Read me, with me. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. <laughs> I can imagine Ezekiel going, yeah, right. If my knees would stop knocking, I'd be able to stand up. But I can't get up. This is just too hard. This is so far beyond me. You know, we sometimes take God kind of lightly. We talk about God. and kind of, You know, Jewish people, they didn't even say his name. But for us, we just kind of, you know, talk about God, make jokes about God, that kind of thing. But they realized there was something amazing. This is the mystery beyond the universe. And I said, he can't stand up. But then read this. As he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet. And I listened to the one who was speaking to me. Ezekiel couldn't stand up. But guess what? God made him stand up. He sent his Spirit into Ezekiel. And that's the same for us. We can't stand before God on our own. We can't just come up and say, Oh, God, I'm going to wander up to you and do this because, you know, I'm a pretty good person or something like that. We can't do that. So what happens? God has to come send his Spirit into us. Luther says it really good in the explanation to the third article of the, of the Creed. Read with me. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in my Lord Jesus Christ or come to him. But the Holy Spirit called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. He's saying, look, you can't believe without the Holy Spirit working in you. As you hear God's word, as it goes into your ears and then goes into your hearts, that's God working. If you believe that message, that's because God is working in your heart to call you to believe in him. And that's called grace. It's nothing you do. It's not because you're a good person. It's not because you're smart enough. It's not because you figured it all out. It's because it's grace. And grace is very central to what we believe. See, God's grace 
empowers us to stand and listen to him, just like Ezekiel. We can't do it on our own, but God says, I'm going to do that for you. And maybe it's not in a vision where the Spirit actually literally picks you up and stands you in front of God, but sometimes God works through his people. Has any of you ever read this book? Um, it's called The Ragamuffin Gospel. It's an older book. Yeah, yeah. That's what you do for getting a seminary professor here, right? You know, it's, now, yeah, you, yeah, it's, it, it's pretty good if you, if you want to read it, if you got some, need some summer reading. But I'm going to read this little part of it, and he's contrasting a Christian gathering to an AA meeting. Um, and so this is the AA meeting that I'm going to share. The meeting opened with the serenity prayer, followed by a moment of silence. The prologue to Alcoholics Anonymous was read from the big book by Harry, followed by the 12 steps of the program from Michelle. That night, Jack was the appointed leader. The theme I would like to talk about tonight is gratitude, he began. But if anybody wants to talk about something else, let's hear it. A hand shot up. Phil said, as you all know, last week I went up to Pennsylvania to visit family and missed the meeting. You know, I've been sober for seven years. Last Monday I got drunk and stayed drunk for five days. The only sound in the room was the drip of Mr. Coffee in the corner. You all know the buzzword HALT, H-A-L-T, in this program. Don't let yourself get hungry angry, lonely, or tired, or you'll be very vulnerable for your first drink. The last three got to me. I unplugged the jug, and Phil's voice choked, and he lowered his head. I glanced around the table, moist eyes, tears of compassion, soft sobbing, the only sounds in the room. Same thing happened to me, Phil, but I stayed drunk for a year. Thank God you're back. Boy, that took a lot of guts. Relapse spells relief, Phil, said a substance abuse counselor. Let's get together tomorrow and figure out what relief you need and why. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I never even made it close to seven years. As the meeting ended, Phil stood up. He felt a hand on his shoulder and another on his face. Then kisses on his eyes, his forehead, his neck, and his cheek. You old ragamuffin, said Denise. Let's go. I'm treating you to a banana split, a tasty freeze. That's grace. Now, that wasn't grace like, you know, the Spirit coming and literally picking you up. But it's grace when God works through his people to just welcome people wherever they've fallen down, wherever they've struggled. Because that's how God's people are. We're called to be that grace in the world. And he gives that grace to each and every one of us. That's the, that's the way the church is supposed to be. Um, can you hit the, the subtitles? there so that uh, Orva can hear us. Sorry, Orva. <laughs> there you go. We got... <laughs> okay. There we go. Um, let's read this together. He said to me, Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to the rebellious pagans who have rebelled against me. The Israelites and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this day. The descendants are obstinate and hard-hearted. So he says to, to Ezekiel, look, I'm going to send you with this grace. I've just lifted you up so you can hear me, and I'm going to send you to these people that are kind of obstinate. Well, if you've read the Bible, the Old Testament especially, you see how God would tell the people, this is the way it's supposed to be, and they wouldn't listen to him. And they would just do what they wanted to do. They were rebellious and hard-hearted. Sound like anybody you know? Like me. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm often, often that way. And they just keep doing the same thing over and over again. It reminds me of this farmer that built this special thing. And this is a true story. He built a, a, a grate to keep his, his sheep from crossing. And it was specially designed because sometimes sheep on cattle grates will actually walk through it anyway. So he designed one that, that was specially designed that sheep, their, their feet weren't long enough to get to the bottom. And so they wouldn't be able to walk over it. Well, they say sheep are dumb, but the sheep on this farm figured out they could roll over the grate. And they rolled over the grate, and then they got out and get over to the neighborhood. And one saw another one do it, and so the whole flock is out in the neighborhood. Farmer brings them back, and they do the same thing and go out again. But that's what he's talking about. That's how we are, right? Again and again, we go back and do the same stupid things over and over again, which is why we need that message of grace. And he says, okay, Ezekiel, I'm going to send you to these people, but they're hard. And you're going to go out there, and you're going to speak to them. And I can imagine Ezekiel's going... I don't really want to speak to those people because they're hard-hearted and, and all of that kind of thing. So what does God say? Read with me. I'm sending you to them, and you must say to them, this is what the Lord says. Yeah, what the Lord God says. You know, I love that. That takes the pressure off, right? 
It doesn't, he doesn't have to come up with some kind of special message. He doesn't have to come up and say, okay, I've got something cute to be able to tell my neighbor about Jesus. He just says, just tell him what I tell him to say. I mean, you just got to say, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose again for you. You don't have to come up with something fancy. Just tell him what God says. That's it. You know? I remember the, the none of you are old enough to remember World War II, um, but in World War II, they had these guys called the Code Talkers. Maybe you saw the movie, The Spirit uh, what are they called? Spirit talkers or wind talkers is what the movie's called, right? They were Navajo men. In the, during World War II, they had, um, they had to send a whole bunch of codes to, to try to, to uh, make the Japanese not know what was going on with the American troops. But the Japanese kept figuring out the codes, and they kept figuring it out again and again until the U.S. Army hired some Navajo, native Nav- Navajo speakers, and these young men made a code based on the Navajo language, which is a very difficult language. And then they would speak this in this code language and tell people what was going on, and the Japanese never were able to figure it out. Those guys are heroes. I mean, that's great. That's wonderful. The fact is, though, they're heroes because they said what they were told to say. Imagine if the code talkers, they started talking to Navajo, started, started telling them wrong messages, and then our ships would be in the wrong place, and it would have just cause chaos. But they listened, and they only said what they were supposed to say. And that's exactly what we do. You know, we don't have to try to impress people. We just have to tell people about the love of Jesus who came into our world, who died for us to forgive us of our sins. It's not a big thing. It's not something we have to, have to, get a, have to go to seminary to figure out, right? I mean, going to seminary is great, but, that's, but we can do it each and every day of our life. Our only task is to share what God has told us to say. That's the, that's the task that God gives us. And then go on, read with me. Whether they listen or refuse to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Yeah, he says, look, they might listen to you, they might not listen to you. But here's the thing. I just want them to know that a prophet has been there. A prophet is somebody who speaks God's word. I just want them to know that my presence has been among them. I just want them to recognize that. And so that's all you got to do. You don't have to worry about the results. Just make sure they know that after you've been there, somebody's been there. I love this picture. This is um, in Wisconsin. I can't remember the name of the place. And if you get a chance to look up the video, look up uh, lightning hits a tree in, in uh, Wisconsin. It's pretty impressive. But the lightning struck this tree. And then here's the picture of it afterwards. You knew the lightning was there, right? Now, I'm not saying that we should be that lightning, that we're supposed to like, destroy people, right? But... We want to make sure that as we live our lives, people recognize that a Christian has been there, that somehow God has been in their midst. That's what God calls us to do. He's given us that incredible grace we talked about so that we can bring that grace to the world, so that people can recognize that God has actually been there. And so here, here's the question that I want to ask you, put into your heart and your mind. When you're gone, will the world know that a Jesus follower was among them? When you're gone, will they know? Will they know that, that somebody who experienced that grace was among them? Will you show that in your life so that people can see and, and understand that grace because you've got a life filled with that grace? Think about that. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> it, you know, very often people think about, you know, what's going to happen when they die? You know, what, what, what's going to happen? I, I heard three guys, and I know Ken's probably even told this before, but uh, three guys were talking about at their funeral. They were, um, they said, what do you want people to say? You know, when you're up there in that casket, and there's people that have gathered to remember you, what, what do you want them to say? And the first guy said, you know, I, I want them to say that I was a good family guy, that I really cared for my family, I took care of them. The second guy said, well, yeah, I really want, I, I really want them to say, you know, that, that I made an impact in my community, that I was, a, I was a leader in my community, and I made the world a better place. And the third guy said, well, I want him to say, look, he moved. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Anyway, the, the thing is, is we do care about what our legacy is, what happens, and, and God cares about that too. But what we really want is people to say, that was a person who loved Jesus. That was a person who, yeah, they were perfect, but they were a grace person, a person that showed that grace in their life. And that's not only just for us as individuals, but it's also for us as a church. Does Monroe know that there's a community of Jesus followers at Peace Lutheran Church? Does Monroe know that we're here? Are we making that kind of an impact? Or, or if our church went away one day, would people just go, 
yeah, I guess there might have been a church there one day. Now, now they've built it. Now they've, I don't know what they built in place of it here. More houses probably, right? Yeah. Desmond Rose, go ahead. Yo, go, please do. Yeah. Yeah, people know Little Dove, right? Little Doves. And that's good. But we want them to know Little Doves and Peace Lutheran Church. And one of the things in the, in the second century, there was a guy named Tertullian. Um, and he... Uh, <laughs> you guys like have friends of Tertullian or something? Okay, yeah. Anyway, Tertullian talked about early ter- the, the early Christians. And he said, he said um, you know, the thing that pagans notice about us is this. He says, look how they love one another. Quotes longer than that. But imagine, we want our church to be that place where people look at our church and they say, yeah, there's a group of Jesus followers there that really love each other. And they really reach out in their community. That church is is filled with the grace. And they, they bring that grace out into the community. And that's what God wants us to be. He gives us that grace so we can share it with others. And I think that's a wonderful calling. Because I, I know that that grace that God's given me has really encouraged and strengthened me to be the person that I am. And so now we want to bring that grace to others to allow them to experience that grace as well. Okay. All right, before we review, any thoughts or comments? Okay, let's review what we talked about a little bit. God's, anybody? Nobody's got the note pages, nobody wrote it down. God's grace empowers us to stand and listen to him. Our only task is to share what God has told us to say. When you're gone, will the world know that a Jesus follower was among them? And does Monroe know that there is a community of Jesus followers at Peace Lutheran Church? Good things to think about. So what's going to be different this week, now that you've heard this message? How is your life and your world going to be different because you've heard God's word? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for that incredible, incredible grace that you've given us, that you've lifted us up and allowed us to stand in front of you to be able to hear your word. Help us, Lord, just to be channels of that grace, to take it out in our community so that people will know, will know that you've been among them, that you have spoken to the world through us. Thank you for letting us have that privilege. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.